Okay, good afternoon everybody um, and welcome to the Medem Marketing Competition. Um, this is the first of our pitch sessions. My name is Ruth Mortimer, I'm the Content Director for Marketing Week. Um, we're a media brand all about marketing and we worked with Medem this year to um, help select the 10 people you're going to see um, over the next few hours up here on stage pitching to win the big prize. Um, just to give you a little bit of context about the Medem Marketing Competition, the idea is to um, celebrate brilliant creativity, execution and show general excellence in music marketing and advertising. This is an international um, contest that Medem, Medem runs each year and it rewards creative ideas that are driven by music. Um, and it can be in any medium at all, it can be digital, it can be more traditional, anything that's enhanced by the use of music. Um, it's open to record companies, to individuals, um, agencies, brands, production companies, literally anyone working with music because we want to see the full scale of activity that's out there um, in the industry. Now how does it work? Um, you guys from around the world all submitted your ideas to Medem um, and I'm really pleased to say that Entries this year were up 61% um, on 2014, which is an amazing figure. So we had more brilliant entries than ever before um, to deal with. They, they then came over to us at Marketing Week, where we went through them, we sifted through them, um, and went through each entry with a fine-tooth comb, trying to understand what had happened. Now, one of the key things about these entries is they are so, so different. And I think you're going to see that from the finalists who are up on stage. They're really different in terms of who entered, the budget they had, the scale they were looking for, the media they were using, the channels, the audience. They could not have been more different. So what we tried to look for was a selection of pro projects that really showed something interesting. Um, the judging criteria we were looking at, um, Medem tasked us to look at the concept, the originality of the idea, the execution of it, and then the eventual results. Um, and if you heard me talking on stage just before, you'll know that the results are all important. So we wanted something that was not only a brilliant idea, but genuinely really met its aims. Um, so what's now going to happen, there's going to be 10 um, finalists who come up on stage to pitch, five now, five after lunch. Um, they get five minutes to pitch to you guys, and then they get five minutes with our jury who are up on stage, I'll introduce in a moment and they are going to grill them within an inch of their lives to find out how the project really worked, how successful it really was. Um, so I'm going to introduce the jury now. Um, if you could wave when you come up, your names are all up on stage, but Marcy from um, Mac Presents, um, Jennifer from City, Christoph from BTC Pop, and Lars um, from Sony Music Entertainment. And these are all people with great gravitas and experience in the music industry. And they also come from a wide variety of areas in the music industry. So we've got different kinds of people from brands to agencies to record labels. So they could really, really understand each project and give great context. So I'm gonna stop talking now and I'm gonna invite um, the first of our finalists up on stage, um, Benjamin from Deru. You're going to see the five pitches and then we're going to break for lunch and then come back here again to see five more. Okay, Benjamin, I'm going to hand over to you. Your five minutes starts now. Hi, everybody. My name is Benjamin Wynn. For the last 10 years, I've been making music under the name Deru. For my newest album, 1979, is all about memories. 1979 is the year that I was born. It's the year that I began collecting memories. I can remember as a teenager that getting a new album felt like a big experience to me. Getting at home, looking at the artwork, listening to it over and over again. It felt important to me and the music that I held in my hands felt valuable. So when it came time to release 1979, I wanted to try to, to uh, give people that same experience that I felt as a teenager. The songs from the album were recorded to cassette tape. Much like the way memories fade over time, I wanted to make the song sound old, grainy, and worn out. I've always released music in the typical formats, cassette tapes, CDs, vinyl, MP3s. But for this album, I wanted to try something different, something new. So with that in mind, I reached out to some friends, and we set out to design a physical object that allowed people to experience the music in a new way. 
This is the Upverse box. It's our version of a modern day time capsule. It's a custom made handheld Pico projector, CNC machine from a solid block of walnut. It houses nine videos, one for each song. Someone can buy it, turn it on, and the album will beam to their walls. It's battery powered, has a speaker so you can take it anywhere. You can hook it up to any sound system. And each unit is handmade and machined in Los Angeles, California, designed by Mark Wisnowski. Working with my art director, Anthony Chanamea, who goes by FX, and a small team of engineers and writers, we built the Upverse box and invented a history surrounding it. We viewed it as an homage to the various media we use to record and share our memories. And working with our writer, David Chun, we developed an origin story centered around a box of old photos and letters found at a flea market and a boy that finds a similar box in his backyard. This allowed us to build a larger framework to develop our own narrative. We made a series of videos, manuscripts, and images as a way to invite the public to discover our mythology. We first shared the project by launching a website that featured a history section where we brought the documents to life with hidden interactions. We then asked our fans to upload a memory in exchange for a song. We did this because we wanted to build an online gallery, a monument to our shared human experience. We've received hundreds of submissions of so far, and they're all powerful in their own way. We also did this because giving away music for free never felt great to me. It seemed like a much more equal exchange to ask for a trade. You give me something important from your life, and I'll give you something important from mine. We launched the gallery section with memories from some of my friends, like Amon Tobin, Nigel Godrich, Gas Lamp Killer, etc. And from the first day that we launched, we were blown away by what people shared with us. Many of the moments were incredibly personal and incredibly powerful. We felt that connecting with listeners was more than just letting people hear the music. It was about sharing an experience with them as well. We then revealed the projector and offered it for pre-sale. We first priced it at $500, and we sold out of these editions before the album was even released. The remaining handful out of the 50 were offered at $1,000 and are almost fully gone. <laughs> these days, music has been so devalued that it's often expected to be free. We wanted to push against that. 500 is cheap in the art world, it's normal in the electronics world, and it's only in the music world that it's perceived as expensive. The project is still evolving with live performances in an iOS app, and finally we're launching a multimedia label which we'll use as a platform for our future experiments. We plan to continue this tradition of extending music into objects, experiences, and performances. We call it ARC. It's an honor to be here, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. Now I'm going to throw it open to the jury to ask you some questions, interrogate you. Who's right. going to be first? I can go. I can go first. Um, very creative idea. Love it. Um, you hold the mic real quick. You uh, mentioned that you had 50 units of the observed box. Is it, was that the total number that you developed? Yeah, exactly. We made 50. So it was always going to be a limited sort of uh, collector's object. Okay, so it wasn't meant to be a scalable 
proposition at this time? No, I mean, you know, part of it because we, we sort of sold them for almost what they cost. At $500, we were basically breaking even which was fine with us, this was about the idea. I mean, we always knew that only 50 people were gonna be able to own one of these objects and have it in their hands. But the idea was that we spread the ideas as wide as possible. So we had the idea of devaluation of music, sort of a new platform to share music, and, and this idea of extending music into various other uh, senses, if you will. So did you gift any of the units to, you know, fans or bloggers or press? Or no, we did, we, no gifts. Um, and, and, you know, and it was, it was sort of a risk, you know, when we were making this thing. I, I had no idea if people were going to spend $500 on a music object, especially when music now is so, uh, you know, it's supposed to be free, basically, or it's a dollar. So uh, we had really no idea if people were going to buy these. And as I said, we sold out of 45 of them before the album was even released, just on the story that we embedded with it and surrounding it and, um, and, and the design object itself. There were many ways to enter this, this project, and that's what we tried to do. You could talk about the videos, you could talk about the object, you could talk about the devaluation of music, or you could just listen to the music, or you could delve into our history and the backstory surrounding it. Fantastic project. Um, I think for me it appears a little bit more like an art multimedia project than a real music marketing project, to be quite fair. The question is, you said the, the aim was to fight against the devaluation of music. From your perspective, how did you measure that and how close did you get to the, resu uh, to the result? And what role did actually music play in the overall concept of the multimedia project? Well, this whole, this whole project started as music, and I'm proud to say that I think it all surrounded and only enhanced the music. There was never a part that, in my mind, took away from the core that was the music. The music came first, everything else surrounded the music as a way to get the music out to more people. It's the reason I'm here talking to you. Um, so in that regard, this all goes back to the music in my mind. It, it, it extends into all of these other areas because it's a multimedia project. I personally find that incredibly uh, exciting. I think that that is where, uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a field that is still pretty unexplored in my mind. Um, so yeah, I, I think the way we fought against the devaluation of music was by saying, this is $500 as a pre-sale. This is worth much more. We've sold, you know, five or six at $1,000. These are, uh, these are worth money because of the ideas, because what we impart into it and because of the, the, the love and the story and the content and, and everything that we bring to it. So I think the way we fought against it was by taking a stand and saying, I'm not going to give you anything for free. I've put a lot of myself into this. We've put a lot of ourselves into this. So uh, that, that is valuable. I absolutely understand it, but it was in your, from your perspective, the music, uh, the project was music driven. Okay, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Uh, do, you, do you think that this kind of project has helped you to be perhaps more identified as an artist or in music business? Do I think the projector will be more identified? What was the question? Do you think that this kind of project has helped you to be more identified in music business oh, or sure. as an artist? Absolutely, yeah. I think that um, I think I think nowadays people respond to big ideas. There's so much music on the internet that I think to differentiate yourself, you have to have a larger idea, something that allows people to say, "Wow, you know, either that's never been done before or." just allows people various ways to enter the project. Um, and so, yes, it has absolutely allowed me to be more visible as a musician. We had, we had quite a lot of, of really good press on the project um, from all over the world. And, and, and the press was not only music related, but uh, you know, film, art, uh, multimedia related. Uh, so so it's, it, it, this all came down to me trying to spread my name and these ideas as wide as possible. How are you able to, um, Jennifer mentioned earlier that obviously you weren't trying to ultimately try to scale this, you just made 45 of the units, but in your mind, what did you do to try to scale it to outside PR to where um, 
more than just 45 people could interact with your new music? Very briefly, because we sure. just run well, out of time. Sure, that's why we that's why we did a number of things. That's why we developed the website that has the history section that's interactive. That's why we developed the online gallery where people can share their own experiences with us and view others. That's why we are developing an iOS app that will feature all of the videos from the project in an interactive platform. So much like the way a projector is interactive, we're going to make this app the same way. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, and if we could um, welcome up on stage Jed Lewis um, from Converse. Come on up, please, Jed. So our next project we're going to hear from is about the Converse Rubber Track Sample Library. Jed, I'm going to hand over to you. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here today to talk about the Converse, Converse Rubber Track Sample Library. Before I do that, I need to give some background on what Converse Rubber Tracks is, just in case anyone doesn't know. Uh, this is a studio that we opened in July 2011 with the idea of building a state-of-the-art studio that is specifically for emerging artists to come in, record for free, and retain all the rights to their music, a no-strings-attached studio. And it's really the, um, become the basis of our, our music strategy. We've brought that all over the world. In the past year alone, we've brought rubber tracks to over 23 cities across the world um, and have permanent studios in Brooklyn, Sao Paulo, and just built one in Boston. So in the past year, we've recorded 700 artists, emerging artists. But even in these physical studios, there's a bottleneck of how many we can record. And we wanted to figure out how we can bring the spirit of rubber tracks to the home studio, to more people. And so that's where we built the Converse Rubber Tracks Sample Library, this idea of expanding our reach, and specifically to artists that use samples as the building blocks to what they create. So there's some pain points in sampling in the sample library landscape. Uh, one, it can be really expensive to buy a sample library. Uh, two, if you get a free resource online, it can be inconsistent quality or hard to search. And there's uh, clearance issues with um, if you're using someone else's intellectual property to, uh, to sample. And then sourcing, where a sample come fr came from, where it exists, how it was made, is very unclear in most libraries. So enter the Converse Rubber Tracks Sample Library, where we have a growing collection of samples recorded all at our rubber tracks and in the spirit of the physical studio it's also no strings attached so the benefits are it's totally free it's high quality recorded in our rubber tracks all over the world it's royalty free meaning that every single sample has been cleared for any kind of usage including including commercial and it's transparent in the sourcing you know who made the sample how they made it where they made it and what instrument they used to date we have 17,500 samples in there and growing uh, every week with 150 50 contributors to that library. Just to give you a look at the interface and what it looks like, you can see when you come to the home page, there's um, a bunch of different sample packs that you can dig, it, dig into, dozens of them. If you look on a sessions uh, standpoint, you'll see on the right side all of the samples, one shot stems from that session, and on the left, a video of how those samples were created, who created them, and what instruments they used to do that. You can also look in more of an iTunes view um, and go through all of those hundreds of samples for that individual pack, and it's easy to search. So how it works, we invite artists um, of all ilk into the, uh, into the studio to create these packs. All they're doing is coming in to actually jam and have a jam session. They're really not coming in, we're going to make a one shot of a snare drum. This is really just them jamming. They're compensated for their time, their talent, and for the rights to that music. And it then passed off to our partner in Daba Music, who's our partner in this endeavor, who takes that, chops it up into samples, and put, publishes it on the sample library every two, uh, every two weeks, uh, every Every, on a Tuesday, and it provides samples back to the artist community. So it's really an ecosystem where artists are giving back to artists, and the sample library acts as that middleman. I'm going to show you a video now of some of the contributors to the library, their thoughts on sampling, and the library itself. So sampling has had a long history, and it created a, a kind of a tectonic shift. Music. That's one thing that I really like about using samples is that it gives you a starting point that you wouldn't present to yourself, that you can't really present to yourself. It's nice to have a high quality library that's you know easy to use and uh, it's kind of like 
collaborating at a distance, you know. I believe as a musician, you're supposed to share your music, spread it across the world as much as possible. And any opportunity you get to play and be able to, you know, express your music as a musician, then you should take full advantage of it. So we had some incredible talent that dedicated their time uh, and their, their talents to the, the library. Um, Vernon Reed, members of The Roots, members of Jack White's band, Black Crows, as well as emerging artists as well, giving back to that library. Now, we launched this in February of 2015, and to date we've had 2.2 million downloads, 22,000 subscribers, over a million page views, and users in 183 countries. So if you think back to that world map I showed you a while ago, uh, we've increased the reach of Rubber Tracks by 40 times from what we're able to do with our studios through the library and certainly geographically, exponentially. I think, the, and the most important thing is that the feedback we've gotten through artists directly or through social has been incredible. The social impressions and media impressions have been uh, astounding. Um, and the most important thing to note, finally, is that this isn't a campaign. This is something that will live on indefinitely as a resource for artists all over the world and will continue to grow year by year. Thank you so much for your time. so much, Jed. Over to the jury. I have one question. So, and I'm sorry if this is a stupid one, but so if I'm an artist, any artist can go and log in and become a member because you said there's 20, currently 22,000 subscribers. Correct. So you're just automatic, like if I decide to become an artist tomorrow. You can go in and you, it's open to absolutely okay. anyone. And then if I select one of the samples, then that comes down and no one else can use it? No, uh, anyone can use all, all of the samples. It's just like an iTunes for samples. So it can, one sample could be downloaded as many times as, as uh, someone would want. So um, anyone can use and all of the samples. And that's not weird if it's in a different song, like nope. multiple songs? Okay. No, I mean, that's how sample libraries work right. now, right? You, you, you get one, you get samples, and it could be used in by hundreds right. and thousands okay. of artists, the same exact sample. Again, the samples are just like, it might be a one hit of a drum, which would be unrecognizable, you know, as that being that one specific one, or it might be a longer extension of the song, but most samples are between one and three seconds. Got it, perfect, thanks. Okay, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned social media. How are, how are artists discovering this is available? Is there a campaign that you're running behind it? Um, it doesn't really say anything here, and I don't think you mentioned it. Yeah, there's absolutely no paid media against it. This was all done through uh, PR and word of mouth, and our we we ran uh, press events with uh, myself, and Daba Music, and artists who have used the library to create in uh, around the world. So in New York, LA, Sao Paulo, in. Um, in London to talk about the sample library and we've really got some amazing press energy off of it and we've fed off of that. And then we continue to update with the packs that are interesting of what artists are contributing and some opportunities to use the sample library to continue to promote it. Um, but most of it has all been through word of mouth, organic and PR. Question about communication. Um, with this kind of project, do you think that it is finally the artists that are doing communication for the brands? Um, a lot of the artists, whether they're creating with it or have created to contribute to it, do talk about it. We don't mandate that, but we do find that a lot of artists are talking about it because they've found so much value from it and talk about it to their communities, um, which is a lot of how Rubber Tracks acts in general. Again, we put really no paid media behind it. It's something that's, that spread word of mouth, which is why we thought we were so impressed when we saw you know a million downloads come in in, in 10 days it was from a PR push and then just word of mouth spreading. Yeah, for me, it's absolutely no question that this is a brilliant project, really like it. Um, the question goes more back to what's the role of Converse? I mean, apart from the naming, rubber tracks, I get that. Yeah, um, but what's the brand strategy of Converse and what does actually, what does it mean for Converse that, that there were to like 2.2 million downloads achieved, you know, and so many people are participating? What's the strategy behind it? Let me, let me talk to the role for, for Converse because, you know, our brand conviction, what we stand for is that we believe unleashing the creative spirit can change the world. And the genesis of that was Rubber Tracks, this idea of giving something back and being useful, adding to culture rather than borrowing from it. And Rubber Tracks certainly lets us do that. But what the sample library does is lets us drastically expand the reach of where that can go. 
and, and being useful to thousands of more artists than we could ever do and drive into to a studio. So that really helps us live by our brand principles and stands for who we are in the music space. Um, and then, you know, the millions of downloads, I think, just speaks to how valuable this really was because that was how we judge success is how many downloads, how many users are there going to be that are actually using this as a tool? It's not necessarily traditional ROI of how many more sneakers are we going to spend, are we going to sell because of this? That's not how we judge success. It's how we can be uh, as useful as possible to as many emerging artists who are ultimately our consumers as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any last questions? Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Ted. Okay, great. And now um, we're going to welcome to the stage presenting um, The Dangerous by David Guetta and Mum Project, Rafael Afalo from My Love Affair. Hello, I'm Rafael Afalo, the founder of My Love Affair. So we are a music marketing agency based in Paris and London. And we are here to present you a campaign that we built for Mum Champagne, part of Pernod Ricard and David Guetta, the DJ. So first of all, Moom is the official champagne of the Formula One since more than 10 years. So you know at the end of the race, the pilots get on the podium and they splash the, the, the champagne on the crowd. But they made a survey and they, they saw that around 90% of the people doesn't know that was Moom champagne because they generally look at the pilot, they look at the, the, the splash, but they didn't see the bottle and the, and the logo, and so they didn't know that it was the official champagne. So they ask us how they can leverage the association with this, with this Formula One and get out from the sport and purely Formula One uh, universe and go mainstream to make the champagne more fashionable and you will see. So. And we as shit with David Guetta was the the most powerful DJ on social network with more than 100 million when you you make the addition of the followers and fan on, on social network. So they wanted to be more in the club with the fashion, innovative and more hype brand because maybe you know that for example Dom Perignon with the with the the, the brands phosphorescent you see it in the club. So they they wanted to be more. Um, trendy and to 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 go on mainstream uh, and that and at the same time they wanted to to stay with this partnership with Formula One and to create something special. So we had the EID to to gather three uh, elements. So the brands and you will see that it's something that we built that. Ex exclusively for Giachum, it doesn't work for Coca-Cola, it doesn't work for Dom Perignon. You see it's exactly uh, built for these brands and we merge it with EDM music. Why? Because it's the, now one of the most powerful music listened by young audience. And with Formula One, of course, because it's uh, the partnership that they wanted to leverage. So I'm gonna come from your phone this and get inside the screen, and you're gonna see that. It's really insane. David Guetta Dangerous, the world's first double screen music video. A music video you can watch on your computer and your phone simultaneously without downloading any app. Discover an epic Formula One race between David Guetta and his opponent in which the characters jump from one dimension to the next. Watch David's point of view. Start the race. Receive a call from David Guetta himself and celebrate the victory. So you, you saw with this do double screen music video, so it, the first time for an artist that does this and uh, it's really simple. You have just to synchronize your mobile on the YouTube page of David Guetta. So Moom bought a custom page on YouTube and uh, when you synchronize it you can see different content you see the featuring you don't see it but the featuring appears on the mobile so you you can see it on and of course all the music video this is the so-called uh, it's a real 
Formula One race, we ran uh, a real circuit in south of Spain. We we partner with Lotus to bring uh, more than 30 engineers and the car and six Formula One cars. So it's really a race and some of the best uh, pilot friends from Lotus came and you see it on the casting because we asked Jonas Akelen to so he was the director of the music video, David Guetta is the artist, James Purfoy was there for, to be the rival of David Guetta, and Romain Grosjean, who is the form, form, Formula One pilot of Lotus, was there. So it was really exciting, really complicated to merge all these people at the same time with Lotus, because we, we have to partner with Lotus between two uh, real race and to bring all the, the cars uh, there. And at the end, so on the music video, the official one, there you are know, more than 45 really natural, and I want to, to specify this, that it's natural because it's, it's what you see when you see a, a Formula One race. It's always with brands, and so it's not, don't come from, from anywhere. And uh, we have, and what is, was really important is to, to see the real celebration, and it was a key scene of the music video is that David Guetta won, won the race uh, in front of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Romain Grosjean and he, he did the splash and so you can see. Hey, we're out of time. Um, any last words just before we finish up and hand over to the jury? Yeah. So at the end the result is one, uh, one uh, hundred million views, uh, two million did the, the music video double screen and at the end what is really important, for it was a good result for David Guetta but for Mom it was that 14% of gross uh, sales champagne. Brilliant, okay over to the jury, Lars. What a, what a great chance for a brand like mom to participate in a campaign like this and what a great song i think it's for me it's really hard to be objective here because i listen to the song one or two or twice and i have it in my head for the next two weeks just love the song but apart from that i think ruth in your introduction on the presentation before you mentioned that there's only worth in a partnership for a brand really if it's longer lasting so are there plans between mum and david getter to work together in future or is this where the cooperation ends so it's a good question. So it was just a one shot because they wanted to see how they can leverage the association. So what is interesting is that, for example, in Ibiza, it's one of the most places for champagne to be there. So this summer, if you go at Pasha, all the club, there will not be either Moet, but will be now Moom because they, they get in, in the club. Like, so for the, for the clubs too that buys bottle to to uh, LVMH or Perno, so they change and you will see this summer. And the really good, uh, uh, good news is that we are signing for next year with the Saga and I can't say what it will be, but so we'll do something new for the next year with Moom and David Guetta. So it's a plan on, on now two years sure and maybe more. Hello, is it possible to give us an idea of the budget because just before coming there, uh, we have thinking, uh, think about this question of budget and the incidents it will have on the project. So, uh, you have three main blocks. So, of course, David Guetta, but on this project, uh, David Guetta is endorsed by many brands, but it was the, 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 the only one case where he didn't get uh, a good fee because he wanted for him, because Warner didn't have the the money to invest in Jonas Akelon, so it, it cost a lot with a director like Jonas Akelon, and of also for the, the, um, the technology, and he wanted something special for an artist. It's really important to be different from other DJ and to always innovate because he's in the music of technology, and so, and so to, to, to be transparent, the double screen video cost 150K, it's the expense minimum that you have to, to spend on Google, YouTube, if you want to be present. And so, and after there was no, no um, media paid because due to the legal law of alcohol and so they are really blocked on this, this uh, thing. So it was also natural to partner with David that was that I introduced at the first uh, slide is that he's powerful on social network. So it was key to spread uh, this company on a natural way and, and didn't invest uh, on media. So it 
Quick question for you around results. So I know that we couldn't really see the slide, but 14% um, increase in sales. Was that during the campaign? Have they sustained that? Has the brand been able to sustain that? And also, did you do anything around brand recall or any kind of research that shows that this really will stay there for the brand? Yeah, it's interesting. So. To give you, because there is lack and uh, for and uh, so and strength, uh, they did four different study mom without us. So from GFK, from a social network uh, study analysis, so four different ones. And uh, what they saw is that the brand awareness was really uh, increasing. The association with Formula One also, uh, the brand was seen more cooler. But what is interesting is that. They didn't break uh, two countries as they wanted, like US and, uh, and Australia. So they are globally really happy with this result. But for the next one, they ask us to a track of David Guetta. They will break, and they are sure that it will break more on the US and Australia. So maybe we'll do something with Sia, with the featuring of David. That is, but because this, this, this song, Dangerous, was well, uh, sales uh, all around the world, but less than uh, uh, other record of David Guetta that breaks in the U.S. So, so it was in increased globally, but th so they they just uh, analyzed that there is some lack uh, on different countries. Did uh, David support this on his socials? Yeah, so uh, I was uh, late, so he, of course, there was social endorsement, so he post and tweet and share something content. And we launched uh, just uh, one week ago uh, bo Connected Bottle. So this summer, for example, in Pasha and in the club, when they will open the, pon the Connected Bottle, there will be Cam and all the people that just uh, bought this connected bottle. They will be uh, broadcast on all the screen of the club. So it's to connect with the universe of party and to. Uh, okay. Um, we've got to keep going. We've got two case studies um, left, two more pitches. So this one, um, let me welcome to the stage um, Andrew from Dotted Music, who's going to talk about flesh rocks on, on a zombie trip. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Epinov. Uh, I'm a founder of Data Music, which is a music industry blog and uh, an agency. We mainly serve uh, musicians and, uh, since recently, music startups. I'm also, uh, I also run Wispin, which is a music marketing educational pl platform. Uh, so uh, in 2013, we had a chance to work with Life Nation Finland with the record label department, uh, to um, uh, specifically with uh, the new band called Flash Roxon. So the band had formed only a year pri prior to that. They only released uh, one album and um, they had this challenge of building a fan base specifically outside of Scandinavia and uh, selling their album. It was really fun so to, to work with them. The music is great uh, and uh, the guys in the band are really charismatic. And initially we tried a more kind of traditional approach with um, reaching out to music media, for example, writing about the genre and trying to connect them with uh, fans of the music. But it didn't work out too well. Uh, and we looked into, uh, since we didn't have a lot of time, it was only a free month campaign, we looked into uh, what the uh, band was passionate about, and it was Be Great Horror. So, you know, cheap bloods, chainsaw, zombies, and all this uh, kind of stuff. So my team actually had nightmares uh, when the campaign ended. Um, and um, we reached out to a couple uh, developers, and we found one great publisher called uh, Noodle Games, and um, uh, Spoko Games is developer of a uh, mobile game, a uh, chart hopping mobile game called Zombie Road Trip. It's a really cool arcade uh, game where you just drive a car, kill uh, zombies. Uh, really simple, but they're addictive. Really addictive. And uh, we designed a special car branded with Flash Roxon uh, logotype. Uh, we uh, had this agreement with uh, uh, Spoko that uh, they, they uh, imp imp uh, added a bundle to the game uh, with this car, which was uh, available to everyone uh, for uh, like on the band's Facebook page. Um, and uh, the 
as the results, we had this bundle. So you like the man's Facebook page, you get a special car, you, you kill zombies with a special weapon that we developed. It was called, uh, uh, basically it was a chainsaw launcher. And there were two songs, Eve of two songs playing in the background. One is Lonely Rider and another one is Suck My Chainsaw. So it was a really good fit. And he didn't create these songs for the game. It was from their album. Um, and uh, this uh, bundle was released just around Halloween. The game was uh, featured by Apple in the special Halloween uh, category, which helped the numbers. Uh, the band had a terrible online presence before we started working together. And uh, they only had around like 2,000 likes on Facebook. Uh, we, uh, we increased that number. We definitely Definitely, not just chase, chase, chasing the uh, amount of Facebook likes. It's not just it, it wasn't the point. So we saw a great um, increase of engagement. So the people coming from the game who uh, who just uh, discovered the band this way, uh, they like the silly jokes of the, the band members. Uh, they like the music videos. They liked uh, the actual music. So we saw a really high uh, engagement level. Uh, on, on pretty much everything related to the band, so it was a good fit. And uh, we did a little feature for Keep as well to offer uh, a free song uh, on, that can be uh, could be purchased on uh, Amazon um, of, of, by the by the band to those who had, who, who uh, achieved something special inside the game, so for the gamers. Uh, and uh, something else that we, and Ruth, thank you a lot for showing the video in the, in the uh, intro early, it was actually a video for that game, so simultaneously we developed, uh, we partnered with one indie developer to create another game, so it was a really straightforward uh, shooter we uh, designed uh, the the characters uh, so the band members as zombies and you uh, could enjoy the process of killing uh, the band if you didn't like the, the them or, or either way so uh, it was it was just a fun thing to increase the engagement so the point here was to give something additional to those people coming to the bands uh, to the band's work properties to to uh, to experience something, something fun uh, besides their music. So that's pretty much it. Brilliant, thank you. So the objective obviously was driving awareness for the band and making it more public and getting a bigger audience. So that's to be seen as a marketing campaign, looking at the ROI. There were obviously development costs for that game. How high were they? And could you see a conversion going up from the awareness related to the sales. So what was the ROI? I'm, I'm glad that you asked this right now. Uh, so this was a three month campaign with a fixed fee. So it was a full fledged thing. We did a website, PR, social media strategy, uh, the games, everything. The total uh, fee to be transparent was uh, $5,000 for three month campaign. We charge more these days, but it was uh, so everything was uh, for 5K. Uh, and, um, Sorry, including programming the mobile game? Yes. OK, cool. Like, it, it was Great. like, I can tell you <laughs> I later on how, I, I, I can tell you later on how, how exactly we did that. So it was, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it was tough. Actually, it was tough. But we, we managed to do everything for 5K. And uh, the weakest part of the whole campaign is that, unfortunately, we didn't have access to sales data. So um, I. I and uh, this was our goal to see the conversion and so on. We could see only the increase of engagement, but we uh, didn't have any access to streams or sales, nothing. So unfortunately, this wasn't provided. We, Why we didn't you have that. access? Like, did they just not want to share that information or? Uh, there, there was uh, a bit, yeah, so it, it was just uh, uh, a bit weird. Com we, how we communicated afterwards, our main contacts left pretty quickly from Life Nation and so on. So it, was, it just didn't work out for some reason. The, the communication was with the, the company wasn't too great, unfortunately. So we did our best, but we didn't get uh, pretty much any, uh, anything, like any data back. Right. In, in your mind, though, it was a success just based on the engagement through social media? Yeah, I know that it helped uh, the bands uh, secure a uh, European and US tour in just a couple months. And uh, uh, so obviously they were affiliated with Live Nation, but with the record label. So, they, so it, was, uh, it was a big uh, help for, for them. And uh, yeah, so I, I do think that it was a success.
Great. Well, who doesn't love cars killing zombies first and um, an all-in project for $5,000? I think we all need your card. Um, but uh, it, it, the overall goal, goal for these guys was to build a fan base, right? Sorry? B their goal was to build their fan base, yeah, right? Yeah, because they were like pretty much brand new. Uh, so that was the number one goal was to build uh, an online following. Okay, so now they've built this fan base of these zombie lovers, right? So do you think they're staying with that? Have they come to you for a second project or...? What we were afraid uh, of, like they, they would leave, but we saw a really high engagement from these people. They were just saying that they liked the music. So it, it really was a good fit based on, we've been monitoring uh, the, the like mentions and everything for a couple of months. And uh, they seem to, to become fans, even for many of these uh, gamers who didn't know these genres like really existed before. Um. To be sincere, um, that's not the first time that I'm feeling that I'm seeing a close link between, for example, a musician and the video games or mobile games. So my question is, what do you think is unique or really original in your, in your project? Uh, to me, personally, I think that uh, it's the fact that the band uh, didn't have uh, a following and couldn't provide uh, uh, anything in, in, like uh, exposure in return uh, to the game. So uh, we, we couldn't promise uh, the downloads, a lot of downloads, because uh, the band just had a really small following. And uh, it just that the, it was a good fit and uh, the developers liked it. So I, I do think that it's important to know that that the band didn't have uh, a big following and, and it still worked out. So it can work out for indie, indie bands if you work hard on that. Okay, we've done zombies. Um, zombies for um, $5,000, the best ever budget, probably this stage has ever seen. Um, and now we're gonna go on to banking. Um, and on behalf of We Are Social, um, Please welcome Sandrine to the stage. Hi everyone, um, I'm Sandrine, I'm the managing director of We Are Social in France, a communication agency. I'm very uh, honored as well to have been uh, shortlisted and to be here, but I'm also very stressed, so apologies if my voice uh, breaks down. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about an innovative model which we created uh, for the music industry, which we created for Hello, Hello Bank. It's called Hello Play. Um, but first of all, what is Hello Bank? I'm sure you've all heard about BNP Paribas, uh, the bank. Um, and Hello Bank is basically uh, the, um, the new approach. It's, sorry, Hello Bank is BNP Paribas, Paribas news approach to banking, uh, targeting clients who are looking for a simpler, always on the go and connected offer. Um, so after a year of its launch, uh, Hello Bank approached us last year and uh, they basically wanted us to um, uh, generate um, an increasing amount of awareness for the bank. Um, basically because after one year of um, a launch, it's, it's always difficult to emerge, even more so in a very uh, crowded mobile banking um, offering. So the insight, like uh, actually the insight is very similar to any, any brief if you work in communication. The insight was very simple. The insight was um, our clients are connected, they are mobile, they're always on the go. And basically they love music. And uh, as we know, everyone loves music. We are at the Midem for the last three days and we all love music. Um, so the easiest solution actually, the easy solution would have been to um, do some very traditional sponsoring and to sponsor music concerts. Um, but actually what we told um, Hello Bank is that actually you are a pure player. Uh, you're not a traditional bank. You're a bank which is 100% online and actually your target consumer are also 100% online and uh, um, uh, the people that they look up to are people that have created uh, new models. Uh, they are the Netflix, they are the Airbnb, uh, the Uber of, of the, the industry and they are people that actually kind of recreate things. Um, 
a few other insights. It's like, yes, we all love music. Uh, this music is part of us, but actually, and I think this is one of the first um, uh, member of the shortlist that mentioned it, music is very much devaluated. We are used as consumer to not pay anymore for music. Um, we've been hearing about it for the last two days at, uh, at Midem. Um, streaming is, uh, I think yeah, music is, um, streaming is 85 percent of the music, but actually people don't want to pay for it. So how do you actually uh, carry on uh, listening to music when actually it's very hard for artists and even more so for upcoming artists to generate revenues and, and live from music? Um, so based on this, but also based on the fact that uh, in addition to the devaluation of music, we saw upcoming trends like crowdfunding, which is, um, which is uh, becoming huge, uh, but also when you talk finance and banking, you see the rise of bitcoins, virtual currency. So based on all of this, we came up with uh, this innovative model, which um, we called uh, a crowd-sponsoring music platform, which is Hello Play. And I'm going to um, show you a case study, which I like a bit more than, well, a bit better than me, in better English than me, uh, what it is all about. Music is part of us. It follows us everywhere. Music is something that we share. The music also needs our support, so people can carry on living and breathing their passion. For Hello Bank, we came up with an entirely new approach, inspired by some of today's biggest digital trends. Virtual currency, online streaming and crowdfunding. We created Hello Play, a crowd-sponsoring music platform. Hello Play is a new model that converts music you listen to into a virtual currency, Hello Coins, which you can invest into the music projects you love. Log on to the Hello Play website and connect your usual music streaming services from now on. Every time you listen to a track, you collect Hello Coins. The more you listen, the more you earn, the more you can give back. Choose a project and so, so I'm conscious that I've only got 18 seconds left. So basically what we did is um, we um, worked with a, a crowdfunding platform called Ulule in France, uh, which we, um, well, we curate uh, the best upcoming um, project music project, they can be artists, but they can also be makers. We ally them on the platform and every time you collect coins, you can actually give your coins and support the music industry through um, through the platform. So does it work? And this is where the music is from. Um, this is where the music is supposed to be. Sorry, can you? <laughs> um, does it work? Yeah, it works. So yes, I've been at the Midem for the last two days and I've had the chance to finally meet uh, these guys. They, uh, they are the Rusty Bells. They were one of the first uh, projects which were uh, funded through through uh, the partnership between Ulul and Hello Play. Um, they were funded at 61% through Hello Players, and uh, they've had the chance to finance their uh, second EP. They're going on tour, and they actually they were, they were doing an acoustic live session this morning at the Discovery Zone. Uh, but they're not the only one. Uh, All together, over the last six months, um, we've had um, 58 projects fully, um, fully backed up, and uh, more to come. So I know we weren't able to see the very end, but what results did you have that were measurable? Yes, so uh, basically the um, the objective of the of Hello Bank was really to increase its awareness uh, towards uh, within its uh, target consumers, um, but they want to talk the same language as their consumer who are young and mobile. Um, so to date we've had um, almost 700,000 people on, on the website, but that doesn't tell you more, much more. Uh, what's interesting is we've got 10,000 um, active users um, and the, the platform only started six months ago. 58 projects uh, backed, backed up to date and um, more interestingly when you look at the, um, the search convers conversion um, it increased, it doubles actually when you've been um, exposed to a low play. Um. You're, you're speaking a lot about music, so I would like to know, uh, do you think that this has helped to build uh, a trust relation between the brand and, for example, musicians or music business? Because for, you give an example of one band, but it would be interesting for me to know more about this. 
Uh, yeah, spent, uh, as I said, this, uh, this project is in partnership with Ulul, a crowdfunding platform, and I've spent, well, we know them, we've been working with them for the past six months, but I've actually spent uh, two days with them, actually, at the, on the discovery zone, um, and we've been talking a lot about the project, uh, the people that were backed up in the music, and um, the band I met, but they, it's not the only one, they actually, uh, if you look at their Facebook page, they actually thanks uh, Elo Play and Ulul and Elo Bank. Um, so it's part of being, uh, it's a way of being part of um, the music journey and a music journey which actually is part of our clients. Um, great campaign. Looking behind the curtain a bit, um, was there data collected based on the streaming behaviors of the, of the consumers who took part in the, um, in the competition? And then secondly, did the bank profit and benefit from the from the data that was collected in terms of fostering CRM communication or acqu driving acquisition of new customers? Was it related to core business as well? Um, yeah, no, interestingly, when I say that Elo Bank is a very different bank targeting um, a new type of consumer, um, you don't even have to be a client of Elo Bank to uh, register on the Elo Play platform. Um, so yes, of course, they, uh, they track because they want to know if it's working. Um, and if you, do, um, if you do give your data, yes, and this is the way they, they are able to see that the conversion on search is better if you've been exposed. But actually, you can uh, just be a normal person and register to the platform you don't have to be it's it's very you don't have to be a hello sorry hello bank consumers to be on the platform it's very much about generating awareness creating a new model that inspire um, this generation so you weren't required to be a banking customer of the brand to participate is what you're saying exactly so and the bank paid for the points the hello Coins? The coins, yeah, totally. Okay. So there's probably a significant expense to the bank, correct? And uh, yes, for you, which I cannot communicate, but um, it's the first year, it's not a campaign, uh, it's something which is there for the long term. Um, it was very hard when we uh, came up with the, uh, the, 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 the idea uh, last summer actually to um, think about how many users we're going to, um, to collect Hello Coins. It's very hard in terms of projection. Um, so based on the fact that actually, so we put a certain amount of money for the first year and to be honest, it's the same when you talk about bitcoins and virtual currency, their, their value is fluctuating. Um, so it's the first year, it's test, test and learn. Um, but again, I mean, most of the, um, over the 58 projects that have been backed up, um, on average, um, versus like um, a regular user who put money on Ulul, we've, um, we close the deal by 20%. So we come up with the last 20% from users on Eloplay. So we're going to take a break for lunch now. I just want to say thank you very much to the five finalists who you've um, seen on stage today. And thank you very much to our jury. Don't forget, there are five more um, brilliant case studies you can see. We'll be back here at 2.30 p.m. Um, for an hour to see the next five. And then later on today, at half past four um, on the main stage, we'll actually be announcing the winner. Live on stage, we'll be up there and we'll be announcing a gold winner, a silver winner and a bronze winner. So please don't forget, we'd like to see you back here at half two. Thanks so much.